prolonging life is about the optionality, not about the immortality. There is no such thing as death. Now, there is the fear of death, and that is an awful fear. Sometimes it even makes people do things that they shouldn't. But how different things would be if only we could stop fearing death. It has come to my attention that Although I've themed this blog after a Swedish movie with hopes of tackling transhumanism related topics, those themes have been awfully absent from my writing. To address this, I might as well aim for two warblers with one shilling and talk about human longevity from the standpoint of a Swedish movie. Granted, it was made by a Russian, but such are the concessions I have to make. An awful lot of people seem to be inherently against the idea of prolonging human life. Prolonging it in the sense of figuring out ways to affect our cellular machinery or transfer our bodies to grant us indefinite youth. I contrast this with the cruel mockery of prolonging advocated by our medical system, which serves only to make sure our demise is infernally long and sprinkled with horrible physical and emotional pain. Some typical arguments for and against prolonging youth are Counter. You can't reach a sweet spot where you provide de facto immortality to everyone, without controlling our individual right to create new humans on a whim. Any compromise on this topic is such that it would result in society collapsing. Pro, de facto immortality is so great from a utilitarian standpoint, i.e. a few hundreds of millions of times better than managing to eradicate every single pathogen-induced disease, in terms of years of life saved, that it's worth trying to achieve it in spite of the risk. Counter, humans would no longer be humans. The finitude of our condition is an essential part of the good life. Prolonging youth would twist us into things which are grotesque and horrible. Human looking, but nothing like what we are. Pro, humans that live for a very long time would have much higher stakes in everything. People don't care about, e.g., the climate when they are old, because they will be dead in a few dozen years anyway. Or, to put it on a higher level, people discount tail risk because of their short life, Immortal humans would have already destroyed all nuclear weapons except those needed to arm their well-tested asteroid defense system. They would have prepared for a global pandemic, a supervolcano, a solar flare, and switched to 100% clean energy a long time ago. Counter no human would want to live forever. People wish to die at some point. You get bored with life. I think the counter to this argument is a bit more subtle. I also think that the counter to this argument stands to reinforce the pro-prolongation position quite a lot. This argument has to do with the optionality that not having to decay and die brings to the table. It has to do with the deep-seated fear of death that's built into the human psyche. The power of optionality. Having options is an awesome thing. I think everyone that has a lot of options available to them can vouch for this being true. The thing about options is that they not only act as a safety mechanism, they also act as a de-biasing mechanism. The late start fallacy. The endowment effect 
certainly accounts for part of the effect in many cases of sunk cost fallacy. However, the sunk cost fallacy usually appears partially as a result of lacking any seemingly reasonable options. Say, for example, I've been more or less a basement dwelling stoner until age 35. I work a mech job, I watch TV, I eat a lot of junk food, I smoke and I hang out with my free friends that I have known since high school. For the sake of argument, let's assume that being a brave mindset, independent, healthy adult in a healthy relationship, working on something that I love is better than the aforementioned condition. I think that even if I were to accept this, I'd find it hard to find a motivation to move from the former condition to the latter, partially due to a twisted version of the sunk cost fallacy, the idea of sunk time. Now, the idea of sunk time into doing mostly nothing is silly, but it is true. It goes something like, well, yeah, I should be doing X, but look at all the people that started doing X 10 years ago. They are so far ahead. I have no chance of catching up. If I were a fallacy naming Tsar, I'd call this the late start fallacy. It's the assumption that starting too late makes the whole journey pointless. This is a rather silly assumption. Most games one engages in are not zero sum. Engaging in them late is better than never. If you work a dead-end job and switch into programming at age 35, you're probably never going to get to the same interesting projects and high salaries that someone who started at 16 will. But it's still going to be a net gain over working at Starbucks. If you are obese, and at age 35, you start dieting and exercising, by age 45, you'll have a relatively healthy body. However, you're not going to be as healthy as the guy that started at 20, but it's still a net gain. If you learn to play an instrument or sing at age 35, you're not going to become a virtuoso, but you can still have fun with it, find new friends by joining a band, use it to de-stress, do whatever the heck Schopenhauer was talking about, and play well enough to entertain your friends. It's still going to be a net gain. Death and Cognitive Dissonance I think that part of the problem with death is that it's inevitable. Given the option to live forever, people might just call it quits after a few hundred years. However, the problem is that nobody can make that choice. Even worse, while death doesn't claim us until our 60s or later, decay takes its toll much sooner. These are fairly straightforward ideas. Everyone has to die and everyone will decay with each passing moment once they reach the age of 20 or thereabouts. Yet, I feel like most people, even most happy and successful people, can't really fit these into their worldview. There is a cognitive dissonance between saying that life matters, that people around me matter, that I will try to lead the best possible life, and accepting the idea that time is potentially finite. Life is a blip so tiny that it could be discarded as a rounding error when talking about our impossibly large universe. Your consciousness will suddenly stop one day, then you will be returned to nothingness. No heaven, no haze, no slip, 
within mere seconds you go from experiencing the world to not being, as if nothing ever existed. The decay is a similar thing. I've noticed my brain become worse as I age. This worsening seems noticeable when going from a teenager to an adult, e.g. from 16 to 30. But I think most people are in denial about it. It becomes less subtle between the ages 30 and 60, and from there on out it's obviously downhill, no matter which way you look at it. A quick aside. I know some people might be rather sensitive about this issue, at least if I am to judge by the reaction of my friends when I bring this up. But that's specifically why I use this example, to mention a fairly well-backed idea that most of my readers are probably uncomfortable with. The main references I use for this claim are Link 1, a fairly well-established drop in the number of neocortical neurons. The study cited here only starts in adolescence, which is enough to back my claims. However, I'm fairly sure that this process starts about as soon as you are born, but I can't find the relevant studies right now. Second link, high-level function of intelligence plateau and then decline in the 20 to 60 age range. This is a very positive perspective, by the way, because most other studies will show a decline of almost everything starting much sooner. IQ decreases as people age, even adjusting for the Flynn effect, though note the study cited here is only comparing 20-year-olds with 70-year-olds, so there is no in-between cohort. Fourth link, again adjusting for education, but tracking multiple age groups, we see that Verbal IQ is stable or slightly increasing, though maybe this is an artifact of the adjustment, but performance IQ takes a linear path down from 103 to 75, roughly half a point down every year, and this is, again, adjusting for the Flynn effect. Also, there's a bunch of articles, links in the post, showing a more in-depth five-factor intelligence over lifespan model of the IQ decline, but I can't find a source for any of the graphs they have. So maybe they're bogus? I'm fairly sure one of them cited a book linking the article but I can't find the graph that all of them are displaying or similar numbers anywhere in the book. Six, I'm kind of losing track of the main point here. So if need be, I'm willing to discuss more about the literature around the subject in the comments if you are not convinced and I'm not saying that the evidence I presented here is conclusive by any means, but for now, I want to get back to the article. Disclaimer, my personal opinion borders on believing that adjusting for confounders is a technique that doesn't actually work. As currently implemented by most statisticians in most areas where one can do epidemiology. I take the adjusted data here to be potentially further away from the truth than the unadjusted data, but I'm still citing studies with the adjustments because I think the consensus is against my opinion on confounding. At any rate, both the adjusted and the unadjusted data show the same trend, the only difference being that the trend is much more exacerbated in the unadjusted data. Even if you don't choose to interpret the literature on brain structure and function this way, 
I think it's fairly uncontested that your physical ability declines very fast. If we assume being an Olympian or winning an Olympic medal in some sport is roughly equivalent with a peak in a broad range of physical abilities, well, then the numbers are not pretty. You're looking at a peak somewhere between 19 and 40, but usually below 30 for most sports. And there are some outliers like sailing where there are gold medalists over the age of 50. So hopefully you understand why at least one of those three things, those being the impermanence of life, the aging of the brain and the aging of the body, might be uncomfortable to many people. This leads to a situation where you either have to accept the cognitive dissonance or you have to guard against it. The problem with guarding against it is that you are basically denying reality. Usually, especially when you're still young, it's just harmless denial. You ignore the fact that you keep your house tidy in order to find stuff that you sometimes forget about meetings, that your hairline is declining, that you're actually almost halfway through the game of life and it passed by awfully fast. However, in the most extreme cases, guarding against reality means killing people in a holy crusade to grant you access to heaven. Guarding against reality means getting severe Alzheimer's and refusing to step down as the President of the United States. Heck, look at the composition of the European and US political class nowadays. What are people with dementia doing there? I get why you'd still be power hungry at 60, but once you're almost 80 and can't even form cohesive beginner level English sentences, it's time to consider getting that mountain home you've always dreamt about. The same thing happens in the upper management of companies, though especially in the US it's less obvious because companies are less hierarchical and status based than politics. Maybe I'm overstepping by saying the only reason these people are still in the political or business arena is that they are delusional about their own age. However, this perspective perfectly aligns with the few times I went inside hospitals or read about hospitals. I saw the unbearable magnitude that delusion about age can be taken to, so I'm fairly certain I can attribute a lot to those delusions. Both individuals and their relatives care about avoiding death so much that they can go through years of suffering in the most inhumane conditions imaginable in order to delay facing the reaper. Who by very slow decay does an amazing job painting a picture of this. I wholeheartedly recommend it if you have 30 minutes and want to get a bit depressed. The optional resolution. So I hope I've at least established cognitive dissonance about death and aging, as well as the late start fallacy, as two potentially horrible things that plague our species. Is it obvious how prolonging youth is a fix for both of these? Well, it's rather obvious in the case of death and aging. Since removing aging and potentially indefinitely delaying death would give them a voluntary trapping. You might still choose to die. You might even choose to allow death to come naturally through the decline of aging. But this is the difference between knowing that you have the option to visit the cheesecake factory whenever you want versus being forced to eat lunch there 
every single day. One of those things is much more unhealthy than the other. It's also somewhat obvious, in the case of the late start fallacy, that once lifespan and health span are no longer an issue, late starts go away. You can do something until your late 90s, decide it was complete rubbish, and completely change your life around. After all, you've got potentially millions of years ahead of you. I can see this leading to some more slacking. Because you have infinite time to pick up the pace, but I can also see this leading to people pursuing interesting but niche things. Things that aren't actualizing enough to constitute a life's work, but might well be worth 50 years out of a de facto infinite life. Even if this ends up causing people to slack until they are 335, you're still left with people that have 99 point a lot of 9% of their life's potential ahead of them. So I doubt that they will fall into the late start fallacy. And at some point, smoking weed and playing video games gets boring for everyone. Thus, curing aging not only helps in the obvious ways, but it also helps by removing biases and mental blocks that are causing people to lead unauthentic lives and get radicalized into harmful movements. It could be argued that, for example, uh, Varianna-style traditions might suffice to alleviate the fear of death. Heck, it might be argued that well-practiced Western religions could be enough. But philosophy and dialogue are a traditional and well-proven cure for depression. Yet it seems that people much prefer SSRIs. And I don't blame them. For over 50,000 years, people have been trying to cope with the issues stemming from their own mortality. And they have failed. By failed, I don't mean they got a bit sad about it, but rather they poured all that fear and anger into murdering and enslaving billions of their fellow men. So maybe, just maybe, our current coping mechanisms are bad. Maybe, even if most people don't really want to live forever, or even for longer than a hundred years, a cure for aging would still be nice, just as a corrective tool for our irrational death-fearing behavior. (laughs) 